You can always tell when... I wear flannels all year, but when, I, when it's fall, I always feel like, okay, I can wear it without people calling me out. <laughs> We're in Roman, or Romans, that's the youth. Uh, John, chapter 1, uh, we're going to begin in verse, uh, f- we covered 14, but we're going to begin reading in 14 today. Um, we'll be going through 19 through 34. Um, I didn't want to mention the, uh, so the family bar, or the youth barbecue for those who are going uh, it'll be at our house. Um, this, we normally do this every year. I, Angel and I spaced it earlier in the month and realized, shoot, we didn't get that on the schedule. Um, so it's a little bit last minute, but it's for families. And we do this every year, um, especially for, for youth that haven't been coming to a uh, youth group for very long or the kids that are now in sixth grade um, that are beginning to go. Um, it's opportunity for them to get to know us and other youth leaders that um, are part of the youth group. Um, and it's just a fun time just to hang out. Last year we roasted a pig. We're not roasting a pig this year, but it's normally something pretty fun and exciting. So if you come, bring a chair. But otherwise, that's one little plug for you guys. Um, when we, when if you ever go and you read a book, especially a good book like a mystery book or one that has a lot of information, you're trying to figure out a detective type uh, book. As you go through and you read chapter by chapter, you're giving more and more pieces of information. As you're gathering this information, you're building up the ending in your own mind as to what you think is going to be the conclusion at the end of the book. Um, some books that I love reading are Frank Peretti, um, his, a lot of his books, but especially his uh, two books, This Present Darkness and Pierce in the Darkness. It gives a re- really good picture and a description of what um, can be going on behind the scenes as far as the spiritual world with demons and angels and things like that. And each chapter is broken up as you go through and read it. You get, uh, it jumps around. You're getting pieces of information, but it doesn't all come together until the very end of the book and you get the conclusion. And a good writer keeps that what the conclusion is hidden until you get to the very end. And it keeps you engaged and it keeps you reading and it keeps you uh, wanting to continue to go forward with reading the book. Um, And I always try to anticipate and guess what that ending is. That's the way I am whenever I watch a movie. It always annoys people if I watch them. I'm like trying to figure it out, right? Figure it out. And if I can figure it out, then you didn't do a very good job in my, my opinion. But um, So that's how I go through with, with, uh, when I read books. Um, the Bible is a book of mystery in a lot of ways. But unlike a book that has been written by a man, it was inspired by God. And every time we read it, we discover new mysteries hidden within its pages that, have never, that we may have never seen before that are within it. The entirety of the Bible points to Jesus. On this last Wednesday, I was teaching through the book of Joshua, and we're getting towards the end of the book. We'll probably finish it this week. Um, and they've divided the land in, in Joshua, and they are, uh, God uh, is giving the children of Israel these cities that are called cities of refuge. They were um, discussed three times previously that God had commanded Moses to make sure that when they got into the promised land, that they established these cities of refuge. There's supposed to be three on the east side of the Jordan River and three on the west side of the Jordan of River. And there's always, there would always be within a day's journey of where anybody would live in the country of Israel so they could flee there if they needed to flee to one of these cities of refuge. The purpose of the cities was to provide a safe haven for anyone who may have accidentally killed another person without anger or malice towards that person prior in their life. It was to protect against involuntary manslaughter. And we're we're given an example, I believe it was in Deuteronomy, if you're out in the woods with your friend and you're cutting a tree and the axe head of your axe falls off and strikes, flies and strikes your, your friend and he dies from that, back in that day, if you were, if someone was to die in your family, It was common practice for the family members to go and seek the person that killed that person and take vengeance on them and slay them themselves. So if that was happening, you you do that kind of a thing. I gave an example of rocks. uh, If you it talks about rock throwing, um, and I gave a personal example how that almost happened to me when I was a child. (laughs) Um, But uh, how if you were to kill somebody on accident without the intent and you could flee to one of these cities of refuge and take safe haven there. And the city would protect you. The leaders of the city would go and try you and, and investigate your story. And if it was found that it was truly involuntary manslaughter, then you were to live in that city um, and be under their protection, and you weren't to leave that city. You'd be protected from it. And God set this up throughout all of Israel, these six cities. 
Um, when I, um, so as I went through this study, I am looking at these cities, we can see pictures of Jesus in a lot of these cities and some of the things that are mentioned in them. First off, they're called cities of refuge. We know that Jesus is our refuge uh, when we run to him, like he's a place of refuge for us. That's the first one that we can easily identify in scripture that's hidden, maybe hidden from us, that we know that Jesus is a city of refuge or is our refuge. Um, and there's other pictures of Jesus in these cities as well. Um, the names of the cities, they're given, we have their, their Hebrew names that are written and recorded for us, but if you look up the meanings of those names, um, a lot of the names mean things that can be applied to Jesus, one of them being strength. Jesus is our strength. One's fortress. He's our fortress. We can go and be hidden in him. Sanctuary, we can come to Jesus and be in his sanctuary. Um, height is one of them, and we, God raises us up on high when we, when we trust and follow him. Um, these are other pictures that are hidden in that, those chapters as we went through the cities. But the thing that struck me um, the most was it said that when you were to go and flee to one of these cities, if you were needing the refuge and, and to be sheltered by them, that you needed to remain in that city until the high priest of Israel died. And I read that, and I'm like, that is so weird. Why does God give us the high priest's death being the amount of time that I'm supposed to stay in this city? Why doesn't he say for the number of weeks or months or years, he goes and equates it to this person's death? That could be, it could be weeks, months, days, years, or the rest of your life, depending on how old that high priest is and how long God's going to preserve him and keep him as the high priest. You would never know when you're going to be getting to leave that city and be free to go and not have to be worried about this person taking vengeance on you. So naturally, as I read this, it piqued my curiosity, and I needed to dig into it and find out why did God set it up this way. This was specifically set up by him. I want to know why that is. It piqued my curiosity. So I began to dig into it and what the reason was, because I know there's no accidents in the Bible. And what I learned as I investigated is it became clear when I read in the book of Hebrews, in chapters, uh, chapter 2, it says in verse 17 and 18, Therefore... In all things, he had, had to be made like his brethren, speaking of Jesus, that he might be merciful and faithful, be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the high priest. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 20, it gives us a little bit more about this. It says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We as sinners are all in need of fleeing for refuge, like when someone was guilty of involuntary manslaughter in the Old Testament. And our refuge from our sin is found only in Jesus, our great high priest. And it was through his death on the cross, which led to our lives being saved, where we can live in eternity with him. His death only needed to happen once and not repeated for us over and over again in order for us to be saved and be granted our freedom. God gave the command in the Old Testament that the manslayer need to remain in the city until the death of the high priest. This was a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do for us. The high priest would grant freedom to anyone who was in a city of refuge when he died. We are all in need of a city of refuge, as I said a few moments ago. And that can only be found in Jesus, the great high priest, who is the high priest forever and will never die again. Why I am sharing this is because the Bible is an incredible book, a book that is like nothing else in this world. It doesn't matter how many times I may read it, I will discover new truths 
hidden and pictures hidden that tell of Jesus in throughout all of Scripture. We're told in Luke, in, in Luke 24, it says that all Scripture points to Jesus. All of it. From the beginning to the end, it all points to him. The entirety of the Bible, it points to him. And today, as we go through our study, we will see another picture of Jesus from the Old Testament, something God had put into place for the Jews to practice in order to be prepared to prepare them for the coming Messiah. Sadly, during this time, the majority of the Jews were blinded on who Jesus was. But my hope and my prayer today for us is that we will have our eyes opened in a new way to the mysteries that are hidden in this precious book we call the Bible, God's Word for us. So if you will uh, stand in honor of God's Word, we'll begin in verse 14 of chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for, I, for he was before me. In his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is of the, in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? In verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who is coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, he, this is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, on him this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Lord, I just pray right now for this time as we dig into these verses and what you inspired John to write. I just pray, Lord, that you will just open our hearts and our eyes in a new way and remind us of the things that you've done, you've already done, but you do not need to do again because they've already been done for us, Lord. I just pray that we will just trust in you and that we will believe in you with all of our hearts, Lord. And I just pray right now that you will um, not... Uh, distract us with anything from me that may hinder from what your word wants to say, Lord, and that you will just um, be here in our presence, Lord, to be able to hear from you. And we just ask you, and we invite you here today, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. These are some of my favorite verses. This, I say that whenever I teach you anything, I feel like. <laughs> but it is. This, this, this story is the culmination and the, the crescendo of what the whole Bible has been written for, the introduction to Jesus as the Messiah. The last time that I taught, we were introduced to John the Baptist briefly. He's not the author of this book. We've gone through that, and that is John the Apostle or the disciple John. Um, um, but this is another, another man named John, and he was Jesus' older cousin by six months. 
Um, he, we uh, were told he was sent to bear witness of the light, speaking of Jesus being the light. He was a forerunner, meaning he was, come to, he was to come before Christ and prepare the way for the people for when Christ arrived, to be able to announce his arrival and pave the way and make his path straight, he said. John, we will see, did not know who the Christ was when his ministry began and when he was baptizing the people in the Jordan River. He didn't know who the Christ was at this point. He just knew that he was called to prepare the way for the Messiah. The Gospel of Luke gives us a little bit broader picture of who the John the Baptist was, so we're going to turn back on our Bibles and we're going to go to Luke chapter 1. So just back one book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke chapter 1, we're going to be given a description of who he was going to be before he was even born. This kind of preludes the, the Christmas story that we read oftentimes in Luke chapter 2. But Luke 1, beginning in verse 5, says, and we'll read to verse 17, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. It's a great description to have of you. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burnt incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and, will, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel and the Lord to the Lord their God. He will also go, bef or he will also go before him speaking of Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom and the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias, this priest, is given a promise that he and his barren wife, Elizabeth, will have a son, and he is going to be called by God from his birth, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. They are well advanced in years, it says. They are well beyond the age of childbearing. This is very similar to what took place with Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, of Abraham and Sarah being um, in their 70s when God gave them the promise that they were going to have a son. That was going to be Isaac eventually, but he waited until Abraham was 99 years old to give him that son. Well beyond the years of childbearing, right? Um, this is similar to that. And their son is going to be filled with, with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. That is an incredible description and a call that is put on to this child and who this person is going to be. But God had a very, very special plan for him. He was to be filled with the Spirit and the power of Elijah and will be a great prophet who will prepare the way for the Messiah. He will live as a Nazarite under the Nazarite vow meaning he couldn't drink wine or strong drink or cut his hair. We have other examples of this in Scripture. The famous one in, in the Bible is Samson. We know Samson because he had his long flowing hair, right? He was a Nazarite. But there's other people that aren't, it's not as well known that they were Nazarites. One of them being Samuel and the other Elijah. They both were Nazarites in the Old Testament. John the Baptist was called by Jesus as the greatest man to ever live born among women. That is quite the description that Jesus gave him. And this was in Matthew 11, 11. The reason being why Jesus said this is because he had the privilege of introducing the world to God's son, the promised Messiah. Because this, because this is what God had called him to from his birth, 
God filled him with the, his Holy Spirit from the moment he was conceived in his mother's womb. Not after he was born, but from his conception date, he was filled with the Spirit, it said. We don't hear anything else about John the Baptist and how he was raised. The next thing we hear from him is in the Gospel of Mark and Luke, where it gives a description and tells us that John the Baptist was this wild man who lived in the wilderness, looked more like a Viking than an Israelite, because he wore camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist, looked like he could have been in uh, one of these Viking uh, movies that you see of the early uh, Anglo-Saxon times, right? Those guys that wear fur and a belt. It said that he lived in the wilderness. He ate grasshoppers or locusts and honey. That was his diet, like this interesting, crazy man with this long, dreadlock, probably hair, flowing behind him, like a crazy guy, right? A radical, crazy person. But yet everybody is just flocking to him to hear what he has to say. Not but to just see him. I'm sure he was a sight to behold but they wanted to hear what, he, what his message was, who he was. I'm going to read, um, in John again, I'm going to read 19 through 23 to give us a little bit more about him, to refresh us. 19, now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. John the Baptist's ministry has begun, and the people are coming to him by the hundreds and thousands to be able to hear from his message and to be baptized by him. He is gaining so much popularity that the priests in Jerusalem have heard about him and send down men to investigate what is going on. They want to know who is this guy and what is his message. Do we need to be worried about this guy? Who is he and what is he teaching? They want to be able to counter it more than likely in his, in his teachings. <clears throat> John the Baptist immediately tells them when they ask him who he is, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. He does not want to be mistaken as the Christ, and he knows that this may be a temptation for some people to try to place this upon him. John knows full well what his calling is and what his purpose is, and that is to point people to Christ, not to himself. Everything he does is to point people to Jesus. That's how we should be living our lives. Everything we do in our life should be pointing to him, not to ourselves. It should never be bringing us glory because that's robbing from the Lord. The people believed. Um, He also says that he is not Elijah. They believed at this time that Elijah was coming again and was supposed to come before the Messiah was given. And this is from the prophecy of Malachi, gives us in Malachi 4, 5, which is right at the very end of the Old Testament. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This was... This, we know, is speaking of when Elijah came during the Great Tribulation period, um, when he's going to come during the Great Tribulation period. And uh, Bob will go over this when we go through Revelation, we get to that period of time. But what the Jews believed was that that they knew the Messiah was coming, but they believed that he was going to have one coming. One, where he's establishing himself as the Messiah, but two, when he came to rule and reign and have his millennial kingdom. They had prophecies of that. This is why the disciples came to him asking, hey, when you go and set up your kingdom, can James and John said, can we sit at your right hand and your left hand? They wanted to be a part of that right then because they thought that that's what he was going to establish on this earth the first time he came. But the prophecy is given before uh, Jesus' second coming when he comes to uh, be, uh, uh, conquer Satan and the, and the battle that's going to take place. And that second coming, Elijah is going to come prior to that. That's what Malachi is discussing and talking about here. But they believe that the teachings back then believed that this was uh, supposed to happen before the Messiah. So they're looking for Elijah uh, as the forerunner and being the person that came first rather than uh, the Messiah directly. And this is really what led a lot of them to miss, miss Jesus because they think that Elijah hasn't come yet. Um, this teaching was so prevalent that Jesus ne- needed to even address it with his disciples um, in Matthew 17, 10 through 13. Jesus addresses this regarding this prophecy. 
And he says, and his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So this is their question to Jesus. Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did, did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the son of of man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was filled with the spirit in the power of Elijah. We are told um, power, he's filled with that spirit in the power of Elijah, similar to Elijah. And that is a partial fulfillment of that prophecy. And Jesus is clarifying that for his disciples. Yes, this is partially fulfilled because John did have that power, but he was his own person. He was his individual person. He was not Elijah raised from the dead or brought back to, uh, to us. Um, he had a birth, and we went through all of that. Um, John the Baptist knew who he was. There, he's, his calling upon his life is very strong upon him. He's not questioning what his job is supposed to be. And he says in verse 23, when they ask, continue to ask him, I am the, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. This is a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. John the Baptist knew that he was the fulfillment of this prophecy, and he declares it to these men who have come to him. That's got to be an amazing thing to be. Understand that you are here on this earth, and you know that there's this prophecy that's over 400 years old that prophesied about you when you're going to come, and you know that. Like, that's got to be a, a big deal to have to live up to, big expectations. But God had prepared him all the way through. When he went out into the wilderness, he was in the wilderness being taught by the Lord. And we don't know exactly what that looked like, but he, that God did that um, with him and taught, taught him and prepared him for that, to be ready for this position that he's been placed in. It was his job to prepare the people of Israel for the coming Messiah, for the Christ. John is a radical man. The way he lived his life was radical. You can plainly see it if you went and saw him. He looked very different than anybody else. But yet, what was even more radical than what his appearance was, was what he was teaching. He was saying things that no one had heard before. He was doing things that no one had done before. He was baptizing everyone who came to him into repentance of sin. <clears throat> this was not a common practice. It was common. There are ceremonial washings and baptisms that the Jewish people did, but they weren't baptized into the baptism of repentance the way that John is doing it. This was reserved for Gentiles. To baptize Gentiles into Judaism is what this was reserved for. They would, if a Gentile wanted, uh, let's say a Roman came to the Jews and they said, hey, I want to believe in your God and follow your laws and the, and the things that your God has been teaching, they would be baptized into a ceremonial baptism um, into the Judaism faith, the Jewish, the Jewish faith, right? But this was not done for the normal Israelite, for the normal Jewish person. This was, uh, this was a radical thing, a very different thing. But here is John baptizing hundreds of people in the Jordan River. He is baptizing, baptizing, it says, all the people who came to him. Everybody who came to him, he would baptize. He was not being discriminatory. It said that he, uh, that he baptized tax collectors. We are given that description. It says that he baptized soldiers. Soldiers came to him and were baptized. He didn't care whether they were a Jew or a Gentile. He was baptizing and including everybody because ultimately his job is to prepare the way for Jesus, which led to us, all of us needing Jesus. Not just, Jesus didn't come just for the Jewish people. He came for every single one of us, um, Jew and Gentile. And John is kind of being the forerunner and breaking that, that uh, barrier and the first person to really identify that and present that to people. Um, he's not excluding the Gentiles and everybody else who comes to him. When John the Baptist, uh, Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan River, where he is doing this is not near a major city. It says that it's in Bethabara, which is out in the wilderness. This is east of Jerusalem. So if you look at a map of Israel, right, it's this long, narrow strip of land along the Mediterranean Sea. Up in the northern part, you have all the mountains, and then you get dropped down into the Sea of Galilee. And then out of the Sea of Galilee, you have the Jordan River that flows out, and it flows all the way down east of Jerusalem into the Dead Sea. 
So where they're at here, where he is at, is um, right down just north of the Dead Sea is where he is doing this baptism. It's the same place where the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River to come into the Promised Land when they came into Jericho, that same uh, area down at the bottom of it. But it's not a popular, it's not in a, a very populated place. But yet, hundreds and thousands of people, it says, are coming from Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding area. They're coming more than a day's journey to come and hear what John is sharing, to hear his message. And his message wasn't like anything else being taught at this time. If we go back and you look, read through verses 14 through 18, it shares some of, some of his message. It says that Moses, uh, he says that Moses gave us the law, and the law was truth. The law showed us what God's standard is. But the problem with truth is it reveals how flawed we are in comparison to it. Our world is trying to change what truth is all the time. But the problem with that is truth is truth. It cannot be changed. It does not evolve. It remains the same. I said that this is a problem, but it is only a problem if you are believing like the rest of the world and don't believe in God's truth. But if you believe in God and in his, in his word, his truth, uh, his truth is then is a, is a wonderful blessing to us that because it is not changing. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth is that God has a standard that must be kept. And if it isn't kept, then there are consequences to not keeping it. That cannot change. It has to remain the same. This is God's truth. This is what was given to us by Moses, the law. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There, there isn't my truth and your truth or Sam's truth and Peter's truth, right? That's what our world's trying to say. It's everybody has their own truth in their life and how they see life. Through their own experiences, that's their truth. But truth cannot be contradictory to each other. If they're contradictory, then it's not truth. And if your truth does not line up with what Scripture says and what the Bible says, you're wrong. It only can line up with what this says. God gave us his truth through the law given to Moses in the Ten Commandments, which no one has been able to keep. Not a single one of you in here has been able to keep it. I have certainly not kept it. Since we haven't been able to keep these Ten Commandments, we are guilty. On Tuesday evenings, we're, we have Calvary Kids Club with the, the, the kids, preschool through fifth grade. And right now, what they're going through is the, what's known as the Romans Road. They're learning scriptures as they're coming, um, and they're learning why we know these scriptures. We're, one of the things we're wanting to instill in them is they learn these verses, right? But we want to know why they're learning them. What is the meaning behind those verses? We don't want them just to memorize it, just to memorize it, right? It's, it's, that's important, but it's better for them to memorize it and understand why. So if you don't come to Calvary Kids Club, you can learn why. We <laughs> memorize scripture, right? It's a little plug there. But um, so the verses that they are, have just learned in the last two weeks are Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, two very popular verses in the Bible. And they say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. We all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very simple. My five or four-year-old understands this. I explained it to him in saying, hey, if you were to start a race and say, go, and you have to run one time around the track, and you can't make the race is not sinning, Right? And you say, go. The moment you sin, you're disqualified. You cannot continue in the race. You have to stop. You cannot take another step forward. You're glued to that position on the track. The only one who has gone around the track without doing that is Jesus. Nobody else has completed it, right? Um, he's the only one that finished it. So we're stuck. We're, we've fallen short of God's glory by falling into sin, by, by giving into sin, by, by sinning in our lives. A child can understand this. They can understand that they've done something wrong. And then we're told that the wages of sin is death. Eternal damnation in hell is what that death is. You've sinned one time. It doesn't matter how many times you've done something good in your life. It does not wipe out that bad thing that you did. Whatever that may be, you cannot overcome that. <clears throat> and you may be thinking, 
Well, what really is sin? I haven't murdered anybody, right? Like, I haven't done some of these things that the Ten Commandments points out. Um, I've, I've tried to follow God's law. But sin isn't just saying, I haven't murdered somebody. Sin is defined as missing the mark. If you're a marksman, whether you shoot a gun or a bow or, or throw a baseball and try to throw strikes, you have a target. And on that target, you have a bullseye. And the bullseye is in the center of that target, right? We know that's the center. And when you shoot, you need to hit that bullseye dead on. Keeping the Ten Commandments is keeping, or hitting the bullseye. You miss the bullseye. You've missed the mark. That's defined as sin. You fail in one of these areas. It doesn't matter if it's just one. One time, you've missed the mark means that you did not uphold it, you did not keep it. You have fallen short of God's glory. <clears throat> and that means we're deserving of eternal damnation in hell, which was designed and created for Satan and his followers, not for us. But that is where we'll end up if we do not trust in Jesus. Moses gave us the law. He gave us God's truth. But the problem with all with it is all it can do is show me that I cannot live up to God's truth. I cannot live up to his standard. I cannot keep his law. I have failed repeatedly in it over and over and over, and I will continue to until the day that I die. I cannot overcome this on my own. The religious leaders during John the Baptist's time were teaching that you could earn your way into God's favor by keeping the law, but that was never a part of the law. Moses never said that when he gave the law to the, the children of Israel. He never said, if you keep this, then God is going to take you to heaven. No, he said, if you keep it, you will be blessed. And if you don't keep it, you will be cursed. He did say that, uh, and that was prevalent throughout the Old Testament. But he does not say that they can earn God's favor and become righteous in it. The point of the law was to point, uh, was to, point to people that they needed a savior, to point to their sin. We're told this in Romans, that, our, our, that the law was given so that we will know that we are falling short of God's glory, that we are in need of a savior. We have all entered the race, whether we wanted to or not. <clears throat> we are in it, and we need someone to come back and carry us to the finish line because we're stuck. We're stuck in our traps, tracks. We're glued to the track. We cannot take another step forward without somebody who has completed the race already and is able to bring us to the finish line. And this is only, the only person who can do that is Jesus. The religious leaders during this time are teaching Moses' law. They're teaching truth, 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 right? Over and over, just teaching his law and being super strict about it and holding it to the line and, and uh, making sure that you're keeping it every little part of it. But their solution for redemption, for redeeming themselves from not being able to keep the law, was, false, was a false solution. It's a lie. Our good deeds can't possibly wipe out our bad deeds. But this is what the religious leaders were teaching during this time. And then here comes John the Baptist, who they knew was a righteous man. It's, they said that they couldn't go and refute what he was saying, and they were afraid that if they said anything bad against him, then they would end up, the people would revolt against them and there'd be a rebellion against the religious leaders. So they knew they couldn't undermine his ministry because they couldn't find fault in him. God had, had prepared him in a way that they couldn't find fault in him. So they couldn't undermine him. And so they couldn't undermine his ministry. They weren't able to find fault. And here's John, and he's teaching that Moses did indeed give us the law. He gave us truth. But grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. He is offering a solution to their problem. Grace, unmerited favor, being given what you do not deserve. Grace can come through one man and one man only, and that is God's son, Jesus. He is the only one who can offer grace. He is the only one who can carry you across the finish line. He has so much grace and truth, it is overflowing out of him John says in verse 14, it says that he is overflowing. It's a, it, there's so much grace that has come pouring out of Jesus that we can't possibly tap into it and overtap the well of grace that is, that is spewing out of Jesus, that is there for us to be able to dive into and receive. We cannot possibly run it dry. 
These teachings were radical. No one has ever taught about grace before or that grace is even an option. But John is telling the people, Jesus, the Messiah is here and he can offer this. No wonder why the people were coming to John by the thousands to hear his message and to be baptized by him. This is why he is offering baptism into repentance of sin. It, was, it wasn't able to save someone, but it was getting their hearts prepared for Jesus. And this is John's job. They were acknowledging they were sinners and in need of a Savior. That is how John prepared the way for the Lord, for Jesus, and what he was going to do. This is the first step in the salvation process, is to acknowledge that you are a sinner. And this is what John has done, is presented this to them. Verse 24. Now those who were sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who is coming after me is preferred before me. The, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabar beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. John, when these men come to him, does not know who the Messiah is yet. He will find out the following day that Jesus, his cousin, is the Messiah. I have been talking about it already, but it hasn't been revealed to him. He is still waiting to find out, um, and he's continuing to do what God is calling him to do. He says the Messiah will come after him, but he is preferred before him. We know we went over this a couple weeks ago when we talked about how John, um, or that Jesus was given, and he was here at the beginning of the creation of the world. He's always been. We covered that in the first five verses of this chapter. Um, but John is saying here that he isn't even worthy to take on the lowliest servant's job. The person at the, in the bottom of the totem pole, so to speak, in a household was required to remove the sandals of a guest and wash his feet. He's not even worthy to stoop down and take off the sandals of Jesus' feet. That's how unworthy he is. And yet, John is the most popular man in all of Israel at this time, the one that everybody's looking at, and he says, I'm not even worthy to do that for Jesus. That's how insignificant I am in comparison to him. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is... He of whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John is given his moment. He declares to the world the long-awaited Messiah is here. God's Son has arrived. We cannot even begin to understand this moment in the way that the Jews would have understood it in this, at this time. But I am going to try to give you an opportunity to see it from their perspective. Many of you know We'll know this already, but it is still good for us to be reminded of it. Others of you may not have realized this before today. We're going to look at one of the hidden mysteries that the Bible speaks of, a Jesus. And he, uh, before he even came to this earth, that I talked about in the introduction. So turn with me back in your Bibles to Exodus, the second book of the Bible, chapter 11. At this time in Exodus, the children of Israel are in Egypt. They uh, are there when, because Joseph was used to save the world from starvation when it was just him and his family. They had around 70 uh, people, I believe, at that time, and they have since multiplied over a 400-year period into 2 million people. God has blessed them immensely. The only problem is they are slaves to the Egyptians at this point. Moses has been raised up at this point to free the Israelites from their slavery. He isn't doing this by waging war against Egypt, but instead he is allowing God to free them, to free the Israelites. He has been asking Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, to let the people go. And Pharaoh has repeatedly been telling him no. God has sent nine plagues to the Egyptians to show them he, 
that he cannot do what he wants and that they are at the, God's mercy. But up until this point, Pharaoh has hardened his heart and has not let the people go free. So now we're going to begin with the final plague that's given in Exodus chapter 11. And we're going to begin in verse 4. This is the final plague that God says is going to take place. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. The final plague is going to be that the firstborn male children will all die. Not a house will be spared from this. God gives them a warning. They will not be able to escape it unless they follow his directions. We'll skip down to chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and this is his direction, directions on escaping it. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be first, the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it, according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your account, your account for the lamb. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. They shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in the fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall, not let, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it without or with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where, the, where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So God tells the Israelites this plague will fall on them as well, unless they follow what he has been asking them to do. They are given very specific instructions to take a lamb, a male lamb in its first year. And it had to be a firstborn. It needed to be without spot or blemish. It needed to be perfect. It couldn't have a single flaw. They were to bring this lamb into their house and to care for it and to tend to it for four days. And then on the last day, they were to kill the lamb in front of the family. And they were to take the blood and brush it onto the doorpost of their house and on the lintel and on the header of the door. Then they were to roast the lamb over fire and eat it as a family. Then when God would go through, the, through Egypt and kill the firstborn males, he would pass over the houses with the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, and he would not kill their firstborn. He would spare them. God would show his mercy towards them and was accepting the lamb as the supplement to the firstborn male. Then God told them he wanted them to practice this every single year, to remember what he had done for them in the past, and when he passed over them. The Israelites did this religiously, and they still do to this day, thousands of years later. God wanted them to do this because he was preparing them for his son, who would be the final lamb given as a sacrifice for all sin. Imagine what this would look like if this was to take place in your family. I can imagine what this would look like for me, 
My kids would think that this is one of the greatest days that ever happened if I told them that we were going to keep a sheep, a baby lamb in our house with us, to live with us, right? They would, and what would take place? You go and you bring this little lamb into your home, and they're going to grow attached to it. It's going to be there for four days. You can tell them, don't name it. We're going to eat it. And they'd be like, yeah, whatever. It's named Fluffy or whatever they wanted it to name it, right? It would, they would become fond of it, and they would grow attached to it, and they'd grow, uh, uh, and they'd love this little lamb as it's living among them. And as they're growing attached to it, on the last day, on the, on the fourth day, the father of the house would take the lamb and he'd kill the lamb. And the whole family would watch as its blood would run out. And they would see the life slip away from it. The precious, innocent lamb that they had grown so fond of would be killed in front of them. And they would watch as the lamb would be br- the blood of the lamb would be brushed onto the doorposts of the house. And then they would take the lamb and they'd roast it over fire and eat it for dinner. This, I am sure, sounds like a very cruel thing for God to ask them to do. But it was to show them the seriousness of life and what our sin does. The lamb couldn't pay for their sins or take their place. It was a symbol of this. And it set up for what God was going to do ultimately with his own son. When Jesus came to this earth, he was innocent. He was God's firstborn and only son. He was blameless, having been tempted, but never falling into sin, as we just read in Hebrews today. He never missed the mark. He kept God's law, his truth, perfectly, and he willingly came to this earth, leaving his heavenly kingdom to live among us. He was here for 33 years, and those who got to know him grew fond of him and had a relationship with him. And then he went to the cross on Passover. This wasn't a coincidence. This literally took place. Jesus went to the cross on the same night and shed his blood on the same night that all the Jews in that day were killing their lamb and, and, and killing it before their family and roasting on the fire and practicing this. The same exact day this took place. That doesn't happen by accident. God ordained that. He made that happen because he had it instituted thousands of years earlier when he instituted the Passover for them. And when Jesus was killed, his blood ran down the cross, just like the blood ran down the doorposts of the houses in Egypt. And his blood made it so that God can forgive us of our sins and and pass over us. This is why John the Baptist, when, he, when it was revealed to him that Jesus was the Messiah, he declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the final lamb sacrifice. There is no longer a need for the Jews or for us to practice Passover. He has forgiven us of our sin. He is able to carry us to the finish line. He and only he is able to do this. John the Baptist wasn't able to do any of these things. He had no power to save the people. All he could do was tell them about it and about who could, and he declared it to them here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I began my message today speaking about the Bible being a mystery book, and it is, but it is so much more than a mystery book because it holds the truths of our world. It holds the truth, truths to why we are here and why we're on this planet. If you try to think logically about this book and how it was written, there is no possible way it could have been written without the hand of God directing it. It was inspired directly by God. It was written over a span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors wrote this book. And these authors didn't sit down and write the book and say, okay, I need to make sure I don't screw this up or mess it up and connect everything from Genesis into Jesus eventually as they're writing it down. No, they wrote exactly what God inspired them to write. It was God that was tying it and knitting it all together and making it so that the mysteries are hidden and revealed, but they all point to Jesus. Every single thing in this book tells us of Jesus. The entire thing. The more I read the Bible, the more I am amazed by it And the more I am amazed by how amazing and awesome God is. Last week, Peter, during worship, talked about the word awesome and how it is a word 
that in America, we tend to overuse so it's lost its meaning when we use it for God. <clears throat> the power of the word has lost its meaning. But I can't think of a better description of what God is when you think what awesome means, because he is awesome. This is what Moses said when he's up on Mount Sinai. He said that God is awesome. That's the word that came out of his mouth is when he was faced with God. When you were a child, and I'm sure you all can remember back, to when you'd have a picture and it would have all these dots on it, the dot to dots, right? You're given a picture, has all these dots, and each dot's numbered, and you begin at one and you draw a line to two. And you draw a line to three, and you draw a line to four, right? And the picture, and the point is that it, in the end, when you complete it, there's a picture there for you to see, whether it be a picture of a duck or a dog or a barn or a cross or a house, whatever it might be. You're given a picture, a very simple picture in teaching you how to draw. The Bible is very simple. The message of the Bible is simple. All God asks us to do is to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart in Jesus Christ, and we will be saved. That's it. He was faced with, when he's on the cross, he had the two thieves crucified with him, the one on his left and the one on his right. And they, the one was making fun of him, and the other one, he simply believed in Jesus, and Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. He did not understand everything in this book. He had that simple outline picture of Jesus. This guy can save me. And he trusted in that. And he is in heaven today, believing in Jesus. But the wonderful thing is, when we make a, a commitment to the Lord, we might only have that understanding and saying, hey, I want to love the Lord. I believe what you're saying. It's a simple picture. But as we go through life and we walk with him and we take those steps and we go through life, that picture get, takes on details. Instead of being a picture that I put on my fridge for my kids that they color for me or I do a dot to dot, it now evolves into this picture that is the masterpiece and the highlight of my home that I want everybody to see. And I want to put it up for everybody to see because it's this, this beautiful painting or this picture as we get to know Jesus. As we go through our relationship with him and walk with him, that picture becomes more and more and more clear. It begins with a simple decision. That's the beginning. But it just grows from there. With these verses that we've gone through today, I was only able to barely scratch the surface of what is written in them. My hope and prayer for you today and this week is that you will have your eyes opened in a new way of who Jesus is. And if you already know him, that's awesome. We, we praise God for that. I hope that you've been reminded of how great and awesome he is. And even though um, he is so much more than we could ever imagine, and it, he cares for each one of us. I pray that we remember that and reflect on that this week. And if you do not know Jesus, you have not made that commitment, I encourage you, um, to come to me and find me afterwards or find somebody else and make that commitment. I'll be available to do that and to talk to you and explain what that would be. If you've got that today, that simple picture of who Jesus is, find me. Say, hey, I want to know. I want that picture to become more and more vivid and be this masterpiece in my house. All right, you guys can stand. Or I, let me close in prayer and then we'll stand and sing a closing song. Lord, I just thank you for today. I just thank you for your word. I love your scriptures. I love your word that you've given us. And the more I study it and the more I dig through it, Lord, the more um, that you are revealed to me and the insignificantness that I am, but yet you still care for me and you love me and you love each and every one of us, Lord. You loved us so much that you were willing to send your son, your only son, to this earth, to be a man, to be tempted as we are tempted and you can relate to us, and you can be uh, empathetic with us because of that. Um, but you did not fail in a single, single thing. You did not miss the mark. And because of that, you went to the cross willingly, paying for us, paying for our punishment of sin, Lord. And we are so thankful for your grace that you have given us. I just pray, Lord, that we will remember these things, that we will be able to take them home with us and let them just be out overflowing in our own lives so that those around us can see what you have done in us, and they can ask what, that, what is different about us, Lord. I pray that we will just live our lives fully for you, especially in this dark world that we live in. We love you, Lord, and we are looking forward to everything you're doing. And in Jesus' name.